Okay, 702. <laughs> so um, before we begin, um, certainly we have uh, so much to be grateful for today, uh, but we also have some very special prayer requests uh, for members of our congregation. Uh, tonight, we want to pray uh, especially for uh, Sister Mabel Ballinger and her family. Um, we also want to pray for Sister Mary McDonald her family, Sister Barbara Hickam, her family. Uh, these are um, very special prayer requests for this, this time. We're continuing, of course, to pray uh, for uh, Sister Martha McCrary and, and her family as well, uh, even as we celebrate today being National Doctors' Day and uh, for Maya. So just so, so grateful. Um, for what God has done. So mm. it, it just reminds us that in the midst of all of the tests and trials, whatever is going on in your life, we can always find a reason to be grateful. And yeah. so uh, with that in mind, are there any other special prayer requests uh, before we open up? We we'll still uh, continue to pray for my wife, Faye. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. Faye Hill. Correct. Amen. Right. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just come before you yes. this evening. We thank you, Lord, for you. your hand of protection that has covered us this day, yes. for your grace and for your mercy, for how you have shielded us from dangers we could see and dangers we couldn't even see. We didn't even know were around us, but you protect us, uh, yes. protected us until this very moment. We come before you because the word of God it teaches us that we can cry out to you yes. as our father because you, we are your children. Yes. And so we come before you, our heavenly father, and we ask God that you would just move mightily in the lives of the names that we have spoken uh, yes. in advance tonight. But there is so yeah. much sickness and we know uh, that all sickness is not unto death. But yes. there are times when sickness leads to death. And yes. so we pray that we will be able to accept whatever your perfect will is in all of these instances. And that those yes. who are, are in this, these positions, in the hospital, wondering what tomorrow will bring, yes. that they will have the blessed assurance to know that it is well with their souls. Yes. And I yes. pray, God, yes. that you will give us comfort, give yes. us peace, give us wisdom, give us the strength to be able to walk into the hospital rooms and into the areas where, where people are struggling and, and suffering and walk in there with a spirit of hope and a spirit of faith and a spirit yes. of life in the midst of it all, yes. that we might bring comfort to those because we know that you are our comforter. Yes. And so we thank you, Lord, for what you've already done. We ask God that you would just be a part of this discussion this evening. We are endeavoring to hear from you, yes. hear from you individually and collectively, hear from you in such a way that we will be able to apply what we hear and receive to oh, our God. lives. Let yeah. it dictate how, how we live from day to day, the choices that we make, oh, yeah. how we choose to manifest your love, your grace, and your mercy uh, for the benefit of others. And we'll be forever grateful. We'll give you all of the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Very good. Um, we are continuing uh, with our delving, delving into the the final episode of the story of Ruth. And um, so hopefully you have your Bibles handy. We'll go back to Ruth chapter four, beginning at verse nine. We're also um, spending a good deal of time to, tonight, as we did last week, going to the book of Joshua chapter two. Okay, Joshua chapter two. You know, I was, as, I was, as I was thinking about uh, tonight's lesson, and remembering what we talked about last week, how each of us should have a desire uh, to be used by God. We often say that, Lord, just use me. Use me, Lord, in your service. Use me for your glory. But we don't really take the time to think about, think deeply about what that really means. Because many times in order for God to use you, what you're saying is, Lord, I want you to do something through me that will bring glory and honor to you and not to me. 
do something so amazing using my abilities, my opportunities, my hands, my voice, my talent, um, whatever it is that you have placed within me, use it and let me use me, give me an opportunity to use it in such a way that, that it will draw others closer to you, that the testament of my faith will be real in the way that you use me. And, you know, it reminds us that, that God can use us anywhere. It does, you don't have to be, you know, a high level, important person in the eyes of the world for God to use you. God can use anyone, anytime, anywhere. You just got to be open. You got to be sensitive. You have to be willing uh, to just say, Lord, whatever, whatever you give me to do, that's what I want to have. I want to do. Give me the strength and the courage, the determination to, to do that. But many times what has to happen is before God can use us, do something through us, he has to do something in us to prepare us to be used. And so it's just as amazing. You know, we always want to be used for something to come out of us. But for me, it's just as amazing when I recognize that God is doing something in me, he's working something new in me, or he's working some of that old junk that I've been carrying for too long. He's carrying, getting that out of me. He's giving me a, a new understanding of who I am and what my place is in the world. He's giving me a fresh revelation of, of, of how he can bring all the parts and pieces of my life together to make it make sense. You know, I often tell, I used to tell our ministers that, that you will know that you're in the right place for God to use you when all the crazy things that have happened to you suddenly begin to make sense. And when all those puzzles, like a jigsaw puzzle, mm. and when they all begin to fit together and you begin to see the picture clearly, then you will know that you're in the place where God can begin to do something extraordinary through you. The humbling part of being used by God is recognizing that he's got a great plan, a huge plan, a huge plan that didn't begin with you, won't end with you, but he gives you an opportunity for a season to step in and be used by him. And that's just amazing. That's amazing because sometimes that season lasts for a long, long time. Uh, and sometimes it lasts for just a few moments. And so as I was thinking about this, I want to to share something with you. And, and in your own time, uh, you, can, you can look it up online. It's, it's one of my favorite, favorite songs, not just because of the, the melody, but because of the message of the song and the, word, and the words that are contained in the song. And, and the song is entitled, A Great Work. A Great Work, and it's by Brian Courtney Wilson. And you know, since we have audio trouble <laughs> sometimes uh, hearing something that's downloaded, I'm just going to share a, a, some of the lyrics with you. And I want you to allow, uh, just, just relax for a moment and just receive these words. As I sometimes, I, you know, I say, you hear my voice, but I want you to hear God speaking to you through me. Okay. So it's not me but I want you to receive this as though the Lord is speaking directly to you. And this is how the song begins. It says, sometimes there are obstacles in the road that can leave you feeling low and you don't know how to move forward. And sometimes there are turns you wanna take, but the way gets hard to trace. Now you're wondering, how did you get here? But don't you give up until you see how God is ordering your steps so that you can walk into your season. He that has begun a great work in you is faithful to perform it. God is faithful to perform it. And I declare that you will know the favor of the Lord and receive a harvest for your seed. 
And in due time, God will blow your mind with what he has planted inside of you to bless this world as it blooms. And the song ends with this. It says, so what should be considered as we proceed is that this work did not begin with you. Our mothers, mothers, and fathers, fathers planted seeds when we were but the faint notion of a dream in their mind. They hoped for a harvest, a legacy, a great work. So may your next step forward help us to connect the dots and see the picture of greatness. In fact, I hear God say that you are his workmanship, his masterpiece created for such a time as this, for great works, a great, great, great work. So be great. Don't get discouraged. Don't get weary. Keep marching for justice. Keep pressing towards the mark in this wonderful world where our children laugh and pray and dream and see greatness exceeding abundantly more than we can imagine. But let me assure you that it's great because our God is faithful. Yes, Lord, yes, you're great. Amen. Amen. All right. So receive that. Receive that. You know, think about it. Go back, you know, Google it, as we say. Look at the words and um, see if there's, a, if there's a message, a word of encouragement in there for you. And because every time, every time I look at these words, it just encourages me to just trust God. You know, even when I can't see how the story is going to end, I don't know uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. So just trust God today mm -hmm. and to realize that in spite of my insecurities or my imperfections or the things that I may doubt about myself or the questions I may have about what I can do and what I can accomplish, God is still able to do great things through me. And the great things are not to bring glory to, and recognition to myself. The great things, as the song says, should just blow your mind that God was able to do this thing through you that will bless the world, Amen. that will change somebody's life in a, an amazing way. Mm -hmm. And that is the filter, again, that we are looking through as we go into the story of Boaz and Ruth, because I, I can assume, I, I can just assume uh, that none of them had any idea of the great things that God could do in their life. They were simply just trying to live from day to day, be sensitive to the leading of the spirit, hear God and respond but God was doing something much greater that none of them could have ever imagined. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that we talked about last time had to do with, with Boaz. And we were talking about, uh, when we read the, the last few verses in chapter four, we see Boaz as this exceptional, sec exceptional man uh, who has, who has negotiated this deal? Does anybody remember how he negotiated this deal with the, with the other guy, the other kinsman redeemer? Can anybody mm -hmm. tell me how that worked? He he asked the, the um, can't tell. He told the kinsman that he that he was next in line, mm -hmm. and that if he wanted to, uh, that he was next in line to buy the, the land of a of, of a, a Ruth's husband, and mm -hmm. if uh, Naomi's husband, and if if uh, he wanted to do that. He could do that. But then he told him that Ruth went with the land. He had to go with the land. Okay. And so then that's when he said he didn't want to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how he 
then, then he said, I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think he saved the information about Ruth as a as, mm -hmm. as a surprise. Right. You know? uh -huh. Because right. at first he said, "Oh yeah, I'll take your land. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to have the land." Right. But uh, he said, "Yeah, but you got to take Ruth too." Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that lets us know that the Boaz was a was a a, a smooth negotiator, mm -hmm. and um, but we also know that he was a man of integrity because he had, he had by a faith because he had already promised Ruth. That it was going to work out. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So he had a plan, and and God used him in an amazing way. We know a lot of a lot about Boaz, but one of the things that we we that we we introduced last week was that when these great things begin to happen through you, as they happen with Boaz, we can, if we are honest, we have to accept that there were generations who came before us who may not even have known you, you know, but they dreamed of a better life, a life better than the one that they had. And, and in our family history, I think it's safe to say that most of us have some questionable characters in our family history. Oh. Everybody in our family history was not perfect. Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's real close, you know, it's real close yeah. in your family history, your mother, your father, your, you know, and, and, and sometimes yeah. we, we people, you know, your motivation is I'm not going to be like them, you know, and yeah. but sometimes what happens is even as you are not tr trying to be different than they were, there was still something positive in them and that you picked up on. Something that somebody said, whether they were your blood kin or not, but so many seeds, as the song says, have been planted in you by the generations who came before you. And much of what we think we know about ourselves or what we uh, are pleased with about ourselves or what we experience that we are able to do and sometimes we wonder where these abilities or whether this interest or whether this vision of where this vision of the world came from. It's because those seeds were planted in you by the generations that came before you. And so if we want to understand how Boaz could move into this place in God's divine plan for humanity into the, the lineage of Jesus, we have to go back to his original family. And in so doing, we go back and we look at the life of his mother. And, and his mother, in looking at the life of his mother, I hope that you have a, a, a pen or piece of paper nearby. Because what I want you to, what we want to do tonight is we want to, to take a little bit of a psychoanalysis of Rahab. And I want you to see if we can pull out some of her qualities. Okay, you know, you know, you know, you know. I was, I was thinking about this. You know, I was thinking about sometimes you look at little babies, and some little babies, when they learn to talk, you know, they got a lot of mouth on them. You know, <laughs> they're gonna tell you stuff and tell you what they're gonna do, not gonna do, all this stuff, and they all bossy. Then you know, you're just three years old. You're not the boss. You know, mm -hmm. but what we realize now as adults is that sometimes those same characteristics may serve them very well when they get to be an adult. They may be the, the bold spokesperson. They may be the lawyer or the judge. They may be the activist that, that doesn't mind speaking their mind to anybody anywhere. But we saw those seeds uh, in them when they were younger. Now those seeds could go left or they could go right. You know, They could work it for good, they could work it for bad. But by the grace of God, sometimes those characteristics that we see in, in, the, in, the, in the little children um, will be used for his glory. And so we go back and we, and we look at Rahab. And we're just, just going to take some time. We, I, I believe we read Joshua chapter 2, the whole beginning of it, that t tells the story of what Rahab did. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to go back tonight and not read the entire thing, but we're going to walk our way through it. Okay. So just keep it handy where you can see it. One of the things we 
Okay, first of all, let's just by way of review for those who are new uh, this evening. Um, in Joshua, in Joshua chapter two, in the opening verse, it states that Joshua uh, sent spies into from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove, and he instructed them to scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan, especially Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. Now that verse alone uh, has so much information in it. First of all, we, we must recognize that the Israelites that are camped on the bank, on the opposite bank of the Jordan are the new generation of Israelites. Their parents had come to this spot before, but when they were challenged to believe that God could deliver the land into their hands, because the promised land was not vacant, it was fully occupied. And there were civilizations and armies and tribes and there that they would have to fight and conquer in order to take possession of the promised land. And so the first generation of Israelites who had been delivered from, from Egypt didn't have enough faith to believe and because they doubted. They doubted what God could do after he had already parted the Red Sea and brought them to the promise. They didn't believe it. And so they, they had to go back. They were cursed. They went back and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation died and the generation of their children came to maturity except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the ones who, from the original generation, that really believed that God could give them the victory. And so now Moses is, is dead and Joshua is in charge. And the new generation of Israelites are camped on the bank of the Jordan and they are prepared, they are willing. They, their faith has been built up, they're ready to go across the Jordan and take possession. But in order for that to happen, Joshua believes that the first thing he has to do was to send some spies into Jericho because Jericho, this great walled city, stood between the Israelites and the promised land. So you've got the Israelites on one bank, you've got this massive Jordan River on the other side of the Jordan where you've got Jericho. On the other side of Jericho, you have the promised land. So he sent some spies. He said, go in there and spy out, you know, Find out if they're ready to fight. Find out what it's like so that we can come up with a, a, a strategic battle plan for conquering this city. Now, when the spies went in, they were men of God on a godly mission but they didn't have a specific plan. They were just going as they were led, as they felt the, the, the leading of the spirit to go. Now, no one would have assumed that two godly men on a mission to prepare to conquer the promised land would end up in the house of a prostitute. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Ruffin, yes. we have to consider the society in which Rahab grew up in. Okay. In that society, she was honorable. She was seen as a princess, a Canaanite. Okay. So she's acting as she has been raised. Mm -hmm. And that word prostitute doesn't mean in that society what it means in the Israelite society. Or she wasn't as bad as <laughs> we think she was. There, there are historians and, 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 and yeah, scholars who, who have translated the word to mean innkeeper. Um, but it does translate as prostitute or harlot as it is, is stated in scripture. Right. We, 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 could, 
we, we understand that she is not a prostitute like we know prostitutes today standing on the corner right. waiting for somebody to come by. OK, we understand that she was in many instances a a um, a businesswoman. Um, but there were other prostitutes in the Old Testament and the word that they use for her is the same as they use for other women who were prostitutes. So there are all kinds of theories about the culture uh, that determine how we should look at her. But one of the things that we see revealed in this scripture is that she did uh, manage a business where men uh, frequented this business. Right. And so that much we know, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the Bible describes her as a harlot, it's translated as a prostitute. And, but we do know that she was a, a woman with a questionable a lifestyle, mm -hmm. questionable past. And when the two spies ended up in her place, she did not know immediately who they were until the king dispatched some messengers to her place. Now, what this says to us, you remember we talked about this last time, was that when the two spies entered Jericho, they were undercover. They thought they were undercover. But somebody recognized that they were Israelites. Somebody identified them as spies, and somebody went and told the king of Jericho. Mm -hmm. And so he dispatches these messengers because he wants to capture them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to, want to talk about uh, in terms of Rahab is this. The question then, regardless of how extensive uh, her life as a harlot may have been. She was a pagan. She was a prostitute. And so the question then is, what was it about her that God could use? Why was she chosen not, not only to be used by God in an, in an amazing way, to protect the spies, but also to be invited in to the lineage of Jesus. So we don't throw her away or judge her unfairly because of her past, because this encourages us to not be so judgmental because many times, whether we know all the details of someone's past or not, we have we overlook, I, I, sometimes I said we overlook Rahab's in our midst because we assume that we can look at somebody's past or their present and determine for ourselves whether or not God can use them. But the good news for you and for me is that we serve God, a God who always, always looks into our heart. Amen. You know, people look at you from the outside. Mm -hmm. God looks at your heart. Mm -hmm. He looks beneath the mm -hmm. surface of who you are. Amen. And I believe he sees, he is the only one who can truly see all that you were destined to become and what you are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Because people will easily write you off just by what they see or what they have heard. But God is not like that. And so the, the, we study Rahab as a source of encouragement to all of us to know that God can use you and me, regardless of our past, regardless of what we've gone through, of what we've done. Mm -hmm. God knows ultimately who you are and mm -hmm. what you are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, I would say that for the two spies and for Rahab, the fact that they entered into her house on an ordinary, we call it ordinary day, was totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. God moves 
in unexpected moments. And that's why we, we say you got to keep your eyes open. You got to keep your ears open. Mm -hmm. You've got to pay attention because mm -hmm. God is moving. And, you know, when she got up that morning, she had no idea that all of this was going to happen today. Mm -hmm. Pastor, two, I, know that, I know that often, you know, as you think about it, all through the Bible, it is about you, God using the least of these yes. to, to bring forth an amazing, an amazing feat, all the way from Noah to build that ark, and everybody thought he was crazy, and he wasn't so sure himself. Mm -hmm. His kids and his wife, everybody, all the way down the line, so many times, he picks the least of these mm -hmm. to do miraculous things. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That seems to be his his, his MOI, <laughs> you know. Yes, mm -hmm. and that should that should encourage us. That should encourage us. All right. Now, when when the king dispatched when the king dispatched these messengers uh, to her house, um, let's look at that verse and see exactly what happens. Okay, let's go back. So the king had sent orders to Rahab. Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. So, you know, just, 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 just to, to, to support uh, some of what Deacon Monroe was saying, the king certainly knew who Rahab was. She was not a stranger. And he knew where her house was. And the expectation was that she would do her patriotic duty. That if the king says, I know there are some men in your house who are not from here. Now you bring them out because they are spies. The king knew that if she refused, that she could be executed for treason. She knew that too. So what does this do in this moment? Rahab had, I don't know why she had done it, but it said before they came, she had hidden them on the roof of her house. She must have sensed that something was going on. And she told you, why don't you all go upstairs, okay? But what does this do? It puts, puts Rahab at a point of decision. Can you see that? She has to choose right then mm -hmm. whether she's going to obey what the king has commanded mm -hmm. or is she going to believe by faith in the God of the Israelites, what she heard about, but she had never experienced. Mm -hmm. So she did, she made a choice, a very, a life changing, history making choice. She lied. She said, yes, they were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. Okay. Then she goes on and lies. They left the town at dusk. Where are they? They're up on the roof, right? They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went, but if you hurry, you can probably catch up with them, okay? And when we look forward at the, the seventh verse, what does it say? So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gates of Jericho was shut. In other words, she sent them on a wild goose chase. <laughs> One of the things that she did, and we talked a little bit about this last time, and when we put, you know, our, 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 our contemporary understanding of, of the male ego <laughs> in this place, and, uh, you know, as I said before, sometimes <laughs> the male ego is so fragile that if the right woman tells you you can do something, you'll you'll break your neck trying to trying to do it because she'll tell you that you can do it. And I, I see here 
that that Rahab understood people. Okay. She understood what to say because they took off running. They didn't question her. They didn't say, we coming in and search. So there must have been something in the way that she communicated with them that they took off running to try to find these men without even questioning her. She just said, they ain't here. I don't know where they went. They left earlier. They went that way. And if you stop, take off running, I believe you can catch them. And what did they do? They took off. They took off. <laughs> so, we'll I tend it. to think those men had frequented her house previously, since so. she was well known in the city. Yeah. So she probably knew. Have mercy. Okay. Well, for whatever reason, they took <laughs> off running. That much, that much we know. That much we know. Okay. Now the two spies. <laughs> Are hiding uh, on the roof. And scripture says that she hid them under uh, flax. Okay? That she hid them under flax, under bundles of flax. You see that in verse six? Mm -hmm. She take them over and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. And for those uh, who, who understand how important it is to study the word, if you don't know what flax is, you have to find out, right? Because there is a message in that. Anytime scripture includes a detail like this that is so specific, it could have said she hid them on the roof, period. But because it says she hid them on the roof beneath bundles of flax, that's an opportunity uh, for you and for me to say, what does this mean? Why is this in scripture? You have to pray for a revelation. And you know, God may reveal something different to you than he did to me. But what we find out is that flax is a plant that they use to make uh, everything from linen to rope. But the plants have to be soaked in st stagnant, dirty water. And it separates the leaves. It separates them, separates them so then that they can be processed. So first of all, as I said before, it lets us know that this establishment she's running downstairs, this uh, bar or inn or whatever it is, a house of prostitution, we don't know. But she runs a business downstairs. We know that, that people frequent. But she also has a side hustle with the flax business upstairs. So what else did that tell us? If you're taking notes on, on, on Rahab, it tells us that she was a good businesswoman. Okay? She, she was a businesswoman, that she was independent, self-sufficient. She was a businesswoman. She had two streams of income, at least, maybe more. Okay. She wasn't married. She didn't have children. Even though there are some historians who say that she may have been in this prostitution business because she was a widow, because it was a common practice then that women who were widowed uh, would turn to prostitution as a source of income. Because as you recall, uh, it was difficult for them uh, in the story of Naomi and Ruth to, to uh, have their needs met without the protection of a man. And so we know now that, that uh, Rahab is doing just fine without this covering of a man and uh, has her two streams of income. But the other thing, the other idea is this. These two men, these two spies on a godly mission to take possession of the promised land, first of all, would not have expected to end up in Rahab's house. And secondly, they find themselves hiding in this unpleasant place in the dark. In the, in, it was wet, it smelled bad, and that's where they are hiding. 
if, if it was you or me in that position, we would say, Lord, I have songs. How come I'm down here? <laughs> Why? How did I end up in this place? But what we have to see is we have to go forward in the story. And when we go forward in the story, we will see that they were in the right place to get what they needed from God in an unexpected place, at an unexpected time, and from an unexpected source. They were right where they needed to be. Look at verse nine. It says, hey, it says, before the spies went to sleep that night. In other words, they were prepared to spend the night if they had to. Rahab went on the roof to talk to them. And look what she said to them. You remember why they're there, right? She says, I know the Lord has given you this land. We have to just put a pen right there because this is a confession of faith. Mm -hmm. She didn't say, I know the Lord will. I know the Lord can but she spoke of it as though it had already happened. So if you can imagine that you were one of those spies and you are hiding in the roof, you don't know if she's going to sell you out. You don't know how you're going to get out of this dirty, stinky place. You don't know what's going to happen next. And this woman who is not an Israelite comes to you in the dark, on the roof, at night, and, and begins to testify. And she says, I know the Lord has given you this land. The victory is already yours. I know it. And then she goes on and she tells him, look, we are all, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. Wow. Who would have expected to hear that testimony from a woman like Rahab. No one have expected it. She spoke of faith. She spoke of power. No one would have expected it. And then when we look at the 10th verse, this is, this is what's so interesting to me. This was what lets us know that where her house was positioned on the top of the walls of Jericho, walls that went up more than 30 feet, Walls that were so thick that you could run chariots around. It was like a street on top of the wall that travelers came in and out of her establishment. And they told the story of what had happened on the other side of the Jericho. And she says, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. Mm -hmm. That was 40 plus years ago when that happened. But yet the testimony of what God had done for his people was still being talked about in this place of pagan worship, this place that did not honor or worship God. They were still talking about what God has done. So, you know, God, you know, this ought to start speaking to somebody real, real soon. And she says, and we know what you did uh, to Sion and Og and the two Amorite kings on the Eastern Jordan River, whose people you completely destroy. And then she goes on to say a little more good news. Okay. And this was the very reason that, that Joshua had sent the two men to Jericho in the first place. He wanted to know how prepared uh, his enemies were to fight. And so Rahab just kept on talking. And she said, no wonder, look at the 11th verse, our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God mm -hmm. of the heavens above the earth and below. Right. Wow, okay. 
Now you just put yourself in the position of the two spies, okay? You're in a position where you feel like personally, you are outnumbered, number one. You are in enemy territory and you are outnumbered. And you are in a place, a very vulnerable place where you, you don't know, of, you know who to trust. You don't know how you're gonna get out of there. Even though you know that you've been, you have been exposed, somebody knows who you are and where you are. I can't even think of a more uh, tenuous and uh, vulnerable position for anybody to be in. And in the midst of that, God speaks through Rahab. Mm -hmm. He speaks faith and power and victory into that situation through a source that you would never have expected. So just imagine hearing that your enemies are in a panic because they've heard about the awesome power of your God. They hadn't witnessed it, but they have heard about it. Imagine hearing that your enemies were already defeated within themselves because they heard about how the glory of God had been manifested in your life. Heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine hearing that your enemies have no courage to fight because they've heard that your God, the Lord your God, is the supreme God of heaven and earth. Your God is God. You know, you can see yeah. God working in, in this text. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you look at pagan worshipers, mm -hmm. such as Pharaoh, they have a God for every situation. Mm -hmm. And they're going to call the whole list off mm -hmm. before they knuckle under. Right. But God has gone before them. He's made the way clear. And all they have to do is follow his instructions. Yes. I found yes. it amazing that Rahab, being a Canaanite, mm -hmm. just knuckled under and accepted God so gracefully. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Just by what she had heard. Heard exactly. Just about what she had heard. And this, this is because these, these travelers are coming in and out of her place and they're talking about it. And she had heard it and she chose to believe. And the moment of her decision was when the spies came, I mean, when the king's messengers came to her door. Door, yeah. That was the moment. Am I going to believe what I've heard or I'm going to do what the king expects me to do? And that was sudden death. Sudden death. For her to accept the God of Israel and defy the God of the king. So what does that tell us? Write something down. What does that tell us about Rahab's and her character in mm -hmm. that moment? Mm -hmm. Okay. But one of the things it tells me is that she could think for herself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. She was not easily she could think for herself, right? <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. She could think for herself and she had reasoned within herself and she came to a decision when it was time and she was courageous and bold enough to stand firm on what she believed what she was believed. the truth yeah. on what she believed okay but what does this say to us i'm you know I, I, you know it, it just begins to encourage me because i know that i'm not the only one who has ever been in a position where you may have felt like you were the only one in the room or that you were not as uh, important or as powerful as everybody else that was surrounding you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have felt that you were not as prepared. Okay. Or maybe you just felt as though you were a little uncertain about what to do next or, or how you ended up in this particular position or whatever it is. And it, it, this comes to encourage me to know that God will go before you mm -hmm. 
so that when you step through the door, the way will already be made. That God will prepare, will put somebody in the right place at the right time Amen. to speak the right words that you need to hear that will strengthen you, empower you, change the direction of your life. God knows how to do that. Mm -hmm. I've had several times when I've had great periods of uncertainty about what to do, how I'm going to do it, if it's going to work, not going to work. Who am I? How did I get here? And God never fails to send somebody, usually somebody I never expected, somebody, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not going to seek it out, but it just comes. Mm -hmm. You know, these men, these men, these spies didn't go to Rahab and say, have you heard? Can you give us some information? She just volunteered it. She just spoke it out. Mm -hmm. you know, unexpected source mm -hmm. in an unexpected way. God will speak. Mm -hmm. And you'll say, let me just chill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let mm -hmm. me just chill because God's got this. Mm -hmm. He's got mm -hmm. it. It's not about my, not about military might because there's, she's saying nobody even has the courage to fight you. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be easy. Okay. It's going to be easy. You're going to win. Mm -hmm. You got the Lord, your God has already given you mm -hmm. this city. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Now, what does it say to us? Rahab was willing to be used by God. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was willing to be used by God. But she also she knew what was coming to the city. She knew people were melting in fear. She knew, but she had enough faith in this moment to believe that God could use her to save her family as well. And so she makes a deal. She's a good negotiator. Mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> and so she negotiates with the spies. And she says in verses 12 and 13, she says, now, now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family. Mm -hmm. Since I have helped you, give me some guarantee. Because, you know, she could still rat them out if she wanted to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many. There she is, that businesswoman again coming out. Yes, <laughs> businesswoman, like the, deal, the art of the deal, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, but she didn't yeah. ask. Now she said, give me. So it's almost a demand. It wasn't, oh, please. Now, would you help us in the future? You know, it wasn't, uh, it yeah. was almost, but almost like she and uh, planned that. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, and they did. They did agree. They agreed to it. They said this. And they said, um, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built on the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Mm -hmm. So they escaped out the back <clears throat> and then told them where to go. <laughs> now, we know that the part of the deal was that she had to hang a, a scarlet rope from that window so that when the Israelite armies came, they would know not to bother that particular house where the scarlet rope was. That was a part of the deal. Now we know, we have a good idea of, uh, we all know the story of how the Jericho walls fell. We know that they didn't have to fight to get into the city, but they did have to go in and conquer the city once the walls fell. But when the walls fell, because there was no way that they could breach the walls on their own. The glory had to go to God. 
And so God imparted the vision for how the walls would fall. And we can, we can go back and we can read about how the priests and the trumpet players and, 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 and the soldiers, how they, they marched around the wall for seven days, one time each day. And on the seventh <laughs> day, they marched around the walls seven times. And then at the sound, uh, at the shout, they were to blow the trumpets. And when they blew the trumpets, the Bible says that the walls of Jericho fell down down. flat. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they have done some archaeological excavations in this area. They have found evidence of these walls. Walls. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, yeah, you know, we're not depending on archaeology, but when we find it, it's just confirmation. And we take it and we say, amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want you to see that the scripture doesn't state specifically, but what I want you to imagine is this. Rahab's house was built on the wall. So when the walls fell down flat and her family was inside of her house where they were protected, And after it was all the dust settled, they were able to walk out unharmed and safe. Mm -hmm. It suggests to me that that portion of the wall did not fall where her house was, which makes it even more miraculous, a more powerful symbol of God's protection. She had already said that God, she had already told him that God, she recognized that God honors his promises. He'll do what he said he will do. And because she had forged this agreement with the spies, God honored it. And all the walls fell, all of the wall fell, except the wall where her house was. Just imagine that. Uh, Just imagine that for a minute. And they walked out and they walked to safety. So if you give me just a few minutes, I believe we can, we, can, we can finish this, okay? At least we can start to finish it. Because Hebrews 11, you see it here on your screen, 30 and 31, talks about Rahab. And it says, by faith, The walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. This was so extraordinary that Rahab is mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. She's mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 where it's recorded that Rahab and a man named Salmon had a son named Boaz. Now, we we believe that Salmon was one of the spies uh, that she hid on the roof. And, uh, (laughs) you know, some some people look at that and they say, well, he didn't have a name until he married Rahab. (laughs) He was just a spy. But once he married her, he had a name because she was so well established. Uh, you know, that's reading a lot into it. But we do know uh, that God did an amazing thing. And their son, Boaz. Now, we don't know how many years it was before Boaz saw Ruth gleaning in the fields. If, if Rahab was still around, she's not mentioned in the book of Ruth. But we do recognize that Rahab's willingness to be used by God, her desire for God to do something great in her, the great thing that she wanted to do was simply to preserve the lives of her family. That's all she wanted to do. She was family oriented. That's another thing that we see. She loved family. She believed in family. And she wanted to protect her family at all costs. She had no idea that her willingness to be used by God in that moment was going to lead her 
into a marriage with Salma, that she was going to find refuge among the Israelites, that she had walked into the lineage of Jesus, that her son Boaz, who remained unmarried for many years, would someday see a woman named Ruth. Boaz was willing to be used by God. Ruth was willing to be used by God. There are certain characteristics that we see in Naomi, I mean, in Rahab, being manifested in Boaz. A good negotiator, a person who loved and respected family, a great businessman, a man of faith, and a man who was willing to be used by God. And I contend that those seeds were planted in him by his mom and maybe his dad too. But we know more about Rahab. No one would have assumed, knowing who his mother was, oh, knowing his mother's past, that she would be able to raise this extraordinary man of faith and courage and sensitivity and compassion and wisdom that God would choose to be in the lineage of Jesus. You see, these people are living thousands of years before Jesus comes on the scene. Yeah. So they didn't know what the end of the story was going to be. They just knew that in that moment, in their season, mm -hmm. they were willing to be used by God. And we are blessed because of it, okay? Wow, we are blessed because Ruth <laughs> and Boaz had a son, Name Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of King David. And after 42 gen and down through 42 generations, Jesus was born. The son of the living God was born. It's an awesome story. It is. It's an awesome story. But it leaves us with this question as we finish tonight for each of us. Are you willing to be used by God in this season where, you are, where we are, even though we don't know what the end of the story is going to be? Just right now, in this moment, in this lifetime that we have, in this place where we are, with the people that are around us, day by day, moment by moment, to just say, Lord, I'm willing to be used by you. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see my family say, but I don't know what the generations of my family will do. Mm -hmm. God knows. And by faith, I believe that just like Rahab and Ruth and Boaz, that if I say yes to God, if you say yes, God, today, right now, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, that God will do great things in you and through you Sorry. that will impact the generations that are coming after you. You just got to say yes. Yes. Okay. As the song says, anyway, you use me. I'll be satisfied. Amen. Amen. Okay. That we Amen. all carry the seeds of what of the amazing things that God can do in a human being. Mm -hmm. As we <laughs> surrender our lives to his hands, to his plan, to his purpose, and say, Lord, just use me. 
use my hands, use my mouth, use my brain, use my ideas, use my education, use my skills, whatever I can do. I just want to use it for your glory and you will be amazed at the great things that God will do. Let us close out in prayer. Thank you for giving me a few extra minutes this evening. And I want to take this time to announce to you uh, that we will not have Bible study next Wednesday because I will be out of town. Uh, speaking of the next generation, um, my grandson has asked me to uh, drive him to uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama uh, for a campus visit at uh, Alabama State. As and he has, a, he has a great scholarship going down there and he's all excited. And so that's where we'll be next. We're leaving next Wednesday. Okay. And so we will not have Bible study, but we'll be back the following Wednesday. Okay? That's just right. like that story you told us about the orange, your cousin in the orange. Yeah. His cousin, his daughter's birthday. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The orange. Remember the orange. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. You are an awesome God. Yes. You're yes. so amazing. We are in awe of what you do in our lives. Yes. Amen. And Amen. So we give Amen. you the glory mm -hmm. because the glory belongs to you. Yes. yes. We yes. Praise your name. Mm. Yeah. We know that you are God, that you are everywhere at all times. You see oh, all yeah. and thank you know you. all. So we call out the name of the Simmons family this yes, evening. Mm -hmm. You know this young man and you know where he is. If he's missing, mm -hmm. we ask God that you would bring him back safely. Yes, yes. That you would give his family a testimony that when they didn't know, couldn't see, mm -hmm. that you were there. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bring him back. Yes. Bring him back, Lord, and bring peace to that home and to that family. Amen. We Amen. thank you in advance for what you're doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we give you the glory. Thank mm -hmm. you for our church, yes. for what you are teaching us, how you're yes. strengthening us and encouraging us thank to you, keep God. on keeping on. Yes. We give the, you the glory. We as we leave this evening, Lord, we, we pray for every home, every yes. relationship that is represented by those who are gathered here. From, from wherever they are. Yes. Just thank you. Thank thank you. you. We praise your name. Yes. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.